Everybody's got a story, you just have to listen. Oh, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. If you are watching this on YouTube, please tap on that thumbs up button. I'd really appreciate it because today is a really cool episode. I've got Mia Magic, who is an intuitive advisor on the podcast. So Mia has this amazing backstory that we're going to get into, but she blew up on TikTok a while back because of her sacred rage ritual. But she is way more than a viral TikTok video. We're going to talk about witchcraft, organized religion, and what led her down this remarkable path. Mia Magic, welcome to Good Listen. How are you? Thank you, Joe. Happy to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you because I want to talk about spirituality. Um, because I know it's in your bag, but it's not exactly your bag, but I'd love to get your take on this. So um, I, I grew up Catholic, went to Catholic school as a little kid. And I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little more agnostic. I always have, I'm, I'm still one of those people like believes in a higher power. I'm not, I'm not egomaniacal enough to think like there's nothing greater out there. Um, but I think a lot of people are like me nowadays. And I saw a stat last year that said more and more people are sort of recognize themselves to be more spiritual than being part of organized religion. And you're seeing like the numbers of people involved in organ organized religion just like plummeting over yeah. the last few years. So let's talk about that space of spirituality and where, where it lies with you. Yeah, I mean, it is definitely my bag. It's my bag in every way, shape and form, every <laughs> direction. It's what I live and breathe. And actually, even using that term, live and breathe, the word Spirit comes from spirare in Latin. It literally means to breathe or to breathe life into. Even the word that the is used in the Bible as Holy Spirit, the Bible was originally written in Aramaic. That word, the Holy Spirit, ruach, it, it means wind. It originally meant wind and it was how the breath of life was breathed into all of us. That was the spirit and that, that God and nature, really like mother nature, all of the plants, all the trees, all the algae in the seas, makes that air for us. And it's this divine design where we inhale their exhale and vice versa. And so to me, that is spirituality. It's knowing that I am part of something greater than myself. My lungs look like the trees that make the air that fill my lungs. And then my lungs exhale the air for the trees to breathe. That can't be an accident. And so to me, I really, I work deeply with the elements and understanding that if we're created in God's image, which like so many people are, have grown up with like a lot of deep religious programming and there's so many truths hidden in the allegory and there's so much potential and so much possibility and so much opportunity hidden behind the lens of something that I think has been just quite honestly, like a little bastardized, like the teachings of Jesus himself charity and to love your neighbor and to have compassion that the kingdom of heaven is within you. That is amazing. But how often are modern religious leaders and groups really living in alignment and integrity with that? And I grew up in a very nature-based household. We were like, my parents were hippies. And so we didn't have much religion, but they had both been raised Catholic. And what they said and what I hear from so many people now is, Either there's, you know, the far end of the spectrum is like I got abused by someone in the church. And so that completely desecrated my view of its its potential as something good. Or I saw the hypocrisy. I saw them say one thing and do another. And that didn't feel right to me. Or I felt the presence of God somewhere. I had a mystical experience. I would go to nature and feel Mother Mother Earth and, and the Holy Mother communicate with me. And then I didn't feel that in the church. And so I think that people are finding spirituality because they're finding what breathes life into me. What connects me to the divine? What makes me feel a, a communion with God? And the biggest thing about religion is that it makes itself the middleman. Rather than you having an autonomous relationship with that higher power, with the divine, with God, whatever that word means for you. I went for a walk with a sister this morning and she was like, so if if you are God, then you also pray to God. Isn't that something outside of you? But it also is you. And we had this beautiful conversation about it just today. And I think that it is, it's just like success. You have to define what the word means for you. And, and religion, I think, is is dropping. And then there's also the other side where there's the, you know, the resurgence of the mega church and a lot of spiritual people like Russell Brand, you know, are, are, are becoming Christian. And I think that's a very interesting return as well. And I think Christ consciousness and the consciousness of 
knowing yourself as an emanation of the divine, knowing your healing powers, knowing your capacity for miracles, I think that that is something we can all strive for. And that's that's regardless of religion or belief systems, that's something that all humans have the capacity to to achieve or to attain. And so I really believe that spirituality is a very individual thing. And my intention is to, the way that a Catholic priest or any type of religious leader in any religion wants to help you find God, my intention is to help people find God in whatever place and whatever avenue and whatever mode of worship works for them so that they can experience what it means to feel life breathing itself into and through you. That's awesome. And you pull you pulled a thread on the thing that drives me crazy about religion, you know, being sort of like a lapsed Catholic is the hypocrisy of it. Um, you know, we're recording this in the middle of an election cycle and I, and when I see Christian conservatives of, you know, pl- you know, throwing that bible around saying well, we have to love each other, love every every living being, but if they're from Haiti it's we don't we yeah. don't want them here. So yeah. it's like please stop with that. Stop using your religion as your your political uh north star when it really should it, it should have nothing to do with politics. But that's neither here nor there. But I yeah. that hypocrisy piece always drove me crazy about religion. And yeah. this goes way beyond this political divide that we're living in. We've always sort of had that. You know, I've, I've joked with past folks about, like, uh, I call them uh, grocery store Catholics. Like, they pick and choose what part of the Catholic religion they like, and then they, they do it. But, you know, speaking of Catholic religion and religions is the structure it provides. Like, here's this book. We have these leaders called priests, and then we have nuns, and, you know, depending on your religion. But there's always, like, a higher authority within the religion. And obviously, with the Catholics, you have the Pope. With spirituality, it's almost like you said, you're making it on your own. So yeah. how do people do that? I mean, obviously someone like you steps in and helps, but for most people that could seem overwhelmed. Be like, oh my God, I'm creating my own spirituality or or my so- sort of lens of spirituality from scratch. Is that is that difficult for people? I think, yeah, of course. I mean, isn't making any choice, it's, it's like the same as like getting up and getting on the yoga mat or going to the gym or like making yourself a healthy meal. Of course, those those it's a lot easier to numb or watch Netflix or, you know, take substances or do anything else. There's a lot of easier things to do. But something that I, I really have noticed in my own life is easy choices, hard life, hard choices, easy life. And so... Yes, of course it can be challenging to decide, oh, I'm going to I'm going to make my own experience of spirituality, but once you find what those things are. Like for me, it was this morning my spiritual practice was going out for a walk in nature. That that's it. My my second book that I'm writing right now is called Ritual, and it's all about creating the rituals that make you feel alive, that make you feel connected to God. If that's, you know, there's some people who that's surfing or that's running. You know, you can sit in silence and in quiet. For some people, it's dance. For some people, it's making music and singing and drumming. And there's making art. Like there's so many different ways that we can connect to God. And so it is really challenging if you if you don't have a, a worship or a routine type of practice. But then that's what's so beautiful is you can make it your own. You can figure out what that looks like for you. And, and I think that that's the biggest piece around you know, religion and and these leaders saying one thing and doing another is that Jesus himself, we could all seek to emulate that way of being. And I'm all for Jesus. I am all for those tenets. But the people who speak on his behalf, I find, like you're saying with politics, there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of blame. There's a lot of wrong making. And that doesn't feel good to me. I I don't I don't think God would have created any or all of us if there was something wrong with us being who we are. And so I like you said with Haiti, it's like I just I believe that we're all chosen or else we wouldn't be here. And so I think that if you can find that within yourself and it is really hard to unwind religious programming and there are tons of amazing leaders and teachers you know, I like to consider myself like a lighthouse. There's a lot of people who are lost in the storm. I'm just going to shine my light. And if you, if this is the direction you want to come and this is something that feels good to you and this feels safe and this feels welcoming and inviting and encouraging, you know, let me help you 
not feel lost in the storm anymore. And, and that has been for me, nature has been that other people have been that. And it is challenging, but it's also really possible. And it's really empowering when you can do it, even if it's, oh, I'm going to sit and meditate for 20 minutes every day, or I'm going to do some mirror work and just tell myself that I love myself because nobody else has really ever made me feel that way before. And so it's it's actually a beautiful opportunity. Of course, it it is challenging, but it's so worth it. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, you mentioned your second book. You have a first book that was Intuition. And I want to get into like the witch part of it because there is this fascination with witchcraft, whether it's you're getting deep into the, <laughs> the organized ones or just basic witchcraft. Uh, full disclosure, a few years ago, I wrote and produced a movie called The Witches of Bushwick about witchcraft because I, I really love the subject of- Okay, of cool. Um, so tell me about witches and why do you think it's had this everlasting hold on us where it's no matter whether in the world of fiction or yeah. in the world of reality, like, like the, the world you're living in is like, why do you think that that resonates with so many people? So the word witch originally just meant wise. It was like the wise woman or the wise man, the medicine man of your village. It was the, that was the healer. That was who you went to. If you had a broken bone, if you were sick, if your baby had a problem, like you went to your local witch because they were the one who knew how to use the plants. This is back when the only medicine we had came from plants. This is before J.D. Rockefeller was like, hey, I can press oil and make it into medicine and you're going to take that now, you know? Right. So this is when we we lived in harmony with the earth. We lived in villages. We lived in in communities. Imagine if today we were like, let's kill all the doctors. It would seem crazy. <laughs> it would it would right. be absolutely ludicrous. And what well, happened- well, I mean, In 2020, a lot of people thought that. <laughs> I mean, that's true. That is very true. Yes. <laughs> um, and there were some doctors who were better than others, you know? Right. But, uh, okay. But that's not here there. there. Continue, please. Well, but the thing about that is, is also, again, with J.D. Rockefeller played a massive role, the oil magnate played a massive role in changing the medical system from a naturopathic, again, since the beginning of time, our medicine has been based in nature. And when he found that he could make petrochemicals into medicine by adding chemicals to oil, (laughs) that's what became our medicine. And he, you know, highly regulated the WHO and the medical system and like how our medicine is taught and operated now. So that changed just in the 1920s. Yeah. So witches, the reason why we had this fascination with them is because they used to be all of us. It was how you got your fields to grow. It was how you knew how to birth animals and milk them and make your cheese and your butter and your medicine. And, you know, we, even our, our last names, Baker, Miller, Smith, that was the person who baked the bread, the person who milled the flour to bake the bread, and the person who was the blacksmith in the town to be able to keep everything running. You know, right. we, we have these names that are these titles, and witches were just the healers. We were the doctors. And so I think that, you know, then the church went in, and instead of trading your local witch, you know, a chicken or a dozen eggs or a loaf of bread for helping your child or like giving you this medicine that you needed. The Catholic church and, and you know, all of its subsidiaries came in and said, okay, well you have to pay to go to heaven. You have to pay to get your grandfather who just died out of purgatory. You have to pay to, you know, even be able to go to the church and where churches were built originally was like on sacred sites that had been places of worship for thousands of years so that people were just coming to the same place where they always worshiped. And then they would do things like burn incense, which is far older than the church, or do baptisms, which is like an ancient Egyptian pre-Catholicism, Greek, Roman, right, for for cleansing and purification. They would do a lot of things. I have, I have some like some of my, um, yeah, like popular content is like how the church stole witchcraft. Because almost everything that the church is doing is old pagan practices pre-Christianity. And so we have this fascination with witches because we all used to have one or we used to know one or we used to trust one. We needed them. And so when the church came in and started the witch hunts, and there's a lot of history you could go into, um, Emperor Constantine was very uh, friendly to the Jews at first in a very pagan polytheistic society in ancient Rome. And by the end of his reign, 36 years later, he had basically like turned his tables and was no longer polytheistic, did not consider himself 
Roman in that way and had become Christian. And then it was the opposite where instead of trying to safeguard the Jews who were becoming the Christians, it was like, no, he and the Jews who had become the Christians were like wiping out all of the pagan people and, and annihilating their, their temples and confiscating their places of worship and their wealth and resources in order to support the Catholic cause and to create places of worship for Catholicism. And that's why the Vatican is one of the wealthiest places in the entire world is because they just went and pillaged all across the globe and like took everybody's gold and said, okay, like these jewels and gems and gold, like this is ours now. And we're going to build our, our scene with it. And that was a huge part of the, the crusades and the missions was not just to <clears throat> spread religion, but to gain Mil I mean, millions and millions and millions of dollars of resources from people who didn't know how to protect themselves and didn't know that they were being taken advantage of. And so I think that when you look at all of these different societies that have been colonized, which is basically the whole world at this point, every one of them had their ancient indigenous practices. They had their magic. They had their connection to God, their unique divine design and 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 line of dialogue and we just went in and said nope this is uncivilized you are going to die if you don't change and we're going to kill your whole family and so your opportunity is either stop singing your songs and stop doing your dances and start worshiping the way that we do or you're dead and so the witch wound is something that I write about in my in my books and talk about a lot and people think that it's just about women or oh, you know, the healers were killed and these 9 million women in Europe. It's not just that. It's about culturally all of the people across all of the world, every single culture that we all come from, no matter where you are, whether you're from Central and South America, from Siberia, from Africa, from Asia, from the oceanic continents, like the Maori people and the aboriginals of Australia, everyone got colonized. And so everyone has this wound around the people that we were so inherently trusting of the ones who did work and strived to heal us. And then those people were made evil. They were villainized. They were killed and, and they were demonized by the church. And then the church took over and said, we are your path to God and we are your healers and you have to pay for it now. And this is it. And people don't think about the, the greater, wider cultural issue in losing all of our witches, all of our wise women and medicine men across the globe. But also during the witch trials and when this would happen, if a man's role, I mean, you're a, you're a husband. Do you have children? No, God, no. Okay, no kids. So, but the man's role is to provide and protect, whether that's, whether that's for kids, for your wife. So every man who watched his mother, sister, daughter, cousin, whatever it was, be taken from her home, strung up, burned, drowned, whatever it was, that man then feels like a failure. And I think we all know what happens to men who feel like failures. They lash out, they behave poorly, they abuse other people because they feel so disappointed within themselves. And so that really is how the patriarchy was formed and how like so much of this abusive, you know, even like looking at the politics, looking at the, the leadership of our planet, like if you can even call it that really, you know, who is actually leading us, stewarding humanity as a global society, it's not happening. It's really not. And so that is, is the birthplace of all of these wounds and all these people who just keep inflicting violence on themselves and each other and children and the earth. It, it all started there from us getting disconnected from the, the true people who were there to, to take care of us yeah. and then trusting the ones who actually are saying that the people who are caring for us are evil, but they're really the ones. You know, there's over half a million open accounts of abuse on from the Catholic Church. Like they have been <laughs> raping and pillaging literally and figuratively for the last 2,000 years and then saying that, you know, and scapegoating anyone, right? It's yeah. like a very Hitler type of situation. Oh, like these are the evil ones. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you're the evil one. So I think that's why people are, are so fascinated with witches and, and want to know these stories is because we all have our own wisdom. That is the path of spirituality. That is our connection to God. That is our way of finding our unique relationship 
And it, it's it been taken from us and programmed out of us and made something that's really unsafe as opposed to the most beautiful part of being alive. That's great. There's so much stuff to dig into there. So let me see <laughs> if I can try. Let me see if I can try. Um, yeah. Well, what I will say, the where as much as capitalism is probably the best ism we've ever had on this planet, it has its faults. And for example, like you're talking about our leaders, at the end of the day, our leaders will do anything for their job. I mean, you see it right now play out in the American political landscape. Essentially, everyone is doing what they're doing to keep their job, whether it fits right for the country, right for the people. That, and in a way, that's sort of how the Catholic religion has worked. Like, like, all right, cool. Like you said, we're going to cast out the freaks. Here you go, because I don't want to lose my gig because this gig is really sweet. I got a house. I got a driver. I don't I don't want to screw that. So I think. As, like I said, as, as great as capitalism has, has been because the other ones haven't worked out in society, it that is one of the faults where essentially, man, for me to be a really good leader, I got to keep my job. And sometimes to keep my job, I got to do shitty things. I just, I don't fully agree with that. I mean, I'm a capitalist. I love money. I run a successful business, but I feel like the way that I operate in capitalism is very regenerative. I I buy everything I can secondhand, even like my Vitamix, my blenders, like my yeah, like I just bought a friend a beautiful housewarming gift. I bought them like a gorgeous hammock that I found on Craigslist. Like I I love capitalism because I want to be able to fly wherever I want and explore the world and 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 vote with my dollar and choose how I spend my money. But I don't I'm not an I'm the way that I'm running my business and my life is not extractive. And I I truly believe that it doesn't have to be. We do not have to be extracting from human resources and environmental resources in order to function. We we survived on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years, yeah. you know, before we operated like this. And I think that regenerative capitalism, I think that as a model to have a more, you know, synergistic and sustainable type of capitalism is entirely possible. We just have to have the kind of leaders who are going to guide us in that direction as opposed to being overly greedy and just be like, well, sorry, this is the way it is, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I think Kara Swisher, a uh, recent book she talked about. So it was just about the money after all, because remember when the social media boom happened in the mid 2000s, it was like, we're going to change the world. We want to connect the world. Yeah. And at the end of it, it was just like, no, no, we just want to be rich and yeah. we want to make give as rich as possible. So it, yeah. it's sad that it always it goes down. All right. Another thing I want to dig into is the, the fact that it's obvious anyone who knows you, follows you, has listened to the last you know 20 minutes of this conversation, you know your shit. Uh, but I always like to say that uh, every kind of field, team, company, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So when you see people yeah. in your quote unquote field, I, for yeah. lack of a better word, I'm going to call it your field, you, you see the phonies. And that was sort of like the, the movie I talked to you about that I made called, which is Bushwick, was basically me making fun of these phonies online that were trying to be like sell shit, but they weren't real witches. Yeah. So that was the gist of the movie. Yeah. What do you feel? Because that was why I was inspired. I was like, wait, these people are all full of shit. They're just trying to get rich or trying to get follows. They're not here for the good. What do you think about the folks in your world? And not that I expect you to shit talk them, but in a way, how does that hurt what you do or affect what you do when people have to go through all the muck to find the folks like you for, like I said, who know their shit? You know, I think that, I mean, I personally don't feel hurt by those people. I'm like, bless, like live your life, do whatever you need to do, you know? <laughs> Um, but I do think that, you know, I get a lot of messages from people who are like, oh, can I pay you to cast a spell on something? And I'm like, no, I don't do that. And for me, like my magic is healing magic. Not to say that I'm like Jesus, but you know, like <laughs> that is, but that is my version of magic. That is how I work in the world. I want to help people heal. I want to heal myself. I want to get my shit, you know, out of the way so that I am the kind of teacher who's really in integrity. And so it's very, again, like I love the word, the Jesus is just the theme in this, but you know, if you, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for the night. And if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for life. That's my intention. I want to teach people how to fish, like figure out how to deal with your shit, figure out how to heal. If someone's like, oh sure, 20 bucks, I'll, I'll give you a spell. If you don't deal with, if you're, say you're, you know, you're casting a, a spell for money, you want more money. If you don't deal with the programming that you have around money, if your father told you that money was the root of all evil, or if your mother told you that, you know, people are, are going to use you for money, so you don't want to have too much because then they're going to take advantage of you. 
if that story is running in your mind and that is deeply ingrained and embedded in your subconscious, you can cast all the money spells you want, sweetheart. They ain't going to work. So I, what my intention is, is to help people understand what's in the way of any spell. It's the same, you know, magic spells. It's all manifestation, right? It's all the same word uh, or the same thing, different words. And so when you're manifesting something, if you use your same affirmations and you're going to like say the same thing over and over and over thousands of times, you have to understand what you're up against. If you have said the money is the root of all evil thing in your dad's voice to yourself hundreds of thousands of times throughout your life, a few little affirmations are not, they're not going to make a dent in that. And so of course there are phonies. There are phonies, there are snake oil salesmen in every single industry all across the world. And even like, you know, when people say, oh, can you help me? Like someone put a curse on me. Or when people are like, oh, so-and-so's doing black magic on me. Like a lot of people will say that about, oh, my, my boyfriend's ex-girlfriend is doing black magic on us. I'm like, that's not possible because you are the only person who can do black magic on yourself. Your will, if you want to choose that someone is doing black magic on you, then like you can choose that. But you are the creator of your reality. So you have to be the one who looks at where am I casting black magic on myself? Where am I speaking unkindly or poorly about myself? Where am I, you know, betraying myself? If you're worried about like someone else betraying you, where are you betraying yourself? And these questions, you know, this is why what I do and how I do it is very different than like someone who's going to just, you know, cool, I wrote you a little rhyme. That'll be $200. Like, no, I what I want to offer people is something, again, sustainable, regenerative, long lasting, what's going to actually help you change your life. And, um, and there are a lot of people, you know, I, I started in the coaching industry. I, I was a one-on-one -on -one coach before I started doing online programs and writing books. And, you know, I can't tell you how many people I watched, even in my own community where I had like done all these trainings and certifications and not like that makes a, a difference. I mean, you know, some people are just innately really good at what they do and, and some are not. Some can take all the trainings and still never be an amazing coach. But I watched people around me notice that I started making money. I started surviving really well off of like clients and then referrals and then groups and and all of a sudden, all these people who were like actors or models or DJs, all of a sudden they were coaches too, you know? And so that that does happen. There's going to be people, like you said, with the capitalism, there's going to be people or social media who jump on a bandwagon because they see that there are there's money to be made. I mean, you know, life coaching wasn't even a thing a few decades ago. Now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And so there are always going to be people like that. And I really believe that going back to the beginning of our conversation, this is why we want to establish a personal connection with God or the divine or whatever that higher power is or find our own spirituality because then we can feel, oh, there's a person that I have resonance with. And and that's something that, you know, in my retreats, I run like beautiful castle retreats. We like go to Hogwarts in England and Scotland and it's like this full, most magical life experience. And But the best comment that I get from people there is, wow, you actually are who you seem like you are on the internet. I'm like, great. Yeah, that's why I don't want to hide things from people. That's why I am a little overly transparent and vulnerable. That's why I will talk about my shit and my shadows and the pain and the problems that I have to deal with because I don't want to put myself on a pedestal and pretend like I'm someone perfect because I'm not. And I don't want to sell that to people. It's ridiculous. And so I think that the people who sell perfection and who don't talk about their shadows and don't talk about their challenges, I think those are the people that you need to watch out for. And and then also, you know, you do have to take responsibility for the mistakes that you make. I mean, there when I, before I got verified, I had hundreds of fake accounts and I had friends of mine, like people who actually know me in real life, be like, oh, wow. You know, I paid a hundred dollars for a reading to your other account and I never heard back from you. And I was like, that wasn't me. You think I'm going to hustle you for a hundred dollar reading? Like, what are you talking about? And uh, other people got readings from these fake accounts and they said they were really good, you know? So, um, but those types of things, like the, 
not using your common sense, not checking in with your intuition, as I call it, not connecting with your inner wisdom, your guidance system. Sometimes that does lead to making mistakes and then we get to learn things the hard way and choose to do them differently the next time around. And so I think we've all had, like I hire, I've hired multiple coaches in my life where it didn't work out and I made that mistake and I sent a lot of money, like either drained my bank account or maxed out a credit card or, you know, and it didn't work out and it taught me a lot. And it taught me a lot about how I want to be as a coach and who I want to be. And so I think that, you know, we just, we just have to really see what resonates with that, that connection that we have to God, what resonates with our heart and our soul, what feels like I know that I'm going to be guided by this person as long as I'm willing to, again, like take full responsibility and, and ownership of my life and do the things that are being asked of me. You know, that's a big part of coaching is you have to do things that are uncomfortable a lot. And so if they're not going to push you outside of your comfort zone, if they're not going to get you to do things that are really going to expand you, I'm I'm curious, like, well, then what what are they doing? And then that would be a question to look at and ask, like, where, why do I trust this person, even though, you know, maybe I already have all this information. And it's really just about the feeling, I think. And where does your moral compass come from? Because I always like to say my mother said when we were growing up, me and my brother, she said two things. She says, I don't care what you do for a living. I don't care how much money you make, but I want you one to be nice to everybody and two be happy in what you do. So that's sort of been my guiding yeah. post for the rest of my life. Like as long as I'm nice to people and I'm happy doing what I'm doing, I think I, I've, I've checked all the boxes my, my mom has laid out for me. So where did yours come from? Because you talk about the fact that it could be a lot, it could be really easy for me and Magic to just be like, hey, cash at me a hundred bucks and I'll, and I'll give you a spell and you can make a lot of money doing that, but you, you, you choose not to. So where does this come from? Is this from your childhood, parents, just personal improvements that you made upon yourself? Like where does this moral compass come from? Again, I think it, it comes from nature. She's really my greatest teacher and, and everything works symbiotically. You know, everything works harmoniously. And I don't, I don't need, I wouldn't want to take from people. I like being in right relationship. I like being in reciprocity. I, again, I love money. I love making money. I love traveling the world and money affords me to do that. I love, you know, I'm in Austin. I can like rent a beautiful three bedroom Airbnb for myself. Like I can do whatever I want. And, and I appreciate that so deeply. And I want to help spiritual people make money. That's a huge part of what I do. And that's why I have really low cost programs and opportunities for people to, to jump in with me um, and to figure it out. But I think that it's everything that you said. It is, it's learning and growing. You know, it's seeing how exchanging spiritual gifts for money, it, it really triggers some people. They're like, you should be doing this for free. I'm like, hi, have you seen the Catholic Church? Like, it ain't free. <laughs> um, but, but again, like someone like me would have been taken care of in my village. I would have, someone would have built me a house or a teepee. You know, people would bring me food and I would just be there like making my medicine and offering my services and I'd be taken care of. It doesn't work like that anymore. So I got to live. I have to pay rent and mortgage and, you know, survive and have a car and pay for gas and eat food and all of the things. And so similarly, though, to you, my mom always said, if you're ever stuck in your own shit, go out and do something for someone else. And so I've always, I, my parents are very, very philanthropic. We, I grew up having a foundation that we were always supporting the arts and music and education and childhood development. And so I really watched a, a regenerative capitalist model. My parents were really, God has blessed them. Like they, they were, my dad wore sweatpants every day. They, neither one of them had fancy cars. Like we had plenty of money and just didn't, the material shit didn't really matter. It just wasn't a big deal. And so I really watched, what does it mean to, again, like love what you do to be happy, to be on purpose, to know that you're creating a positive impact in the world. And then that the fact that you're making money from creating a positive impact, you can create even more positive impact with that money. You can do more. You can, you can build more. You can support people. Like we, I went to a school where we always would plant trees and we would go on backpacking trips. And so I think that when we can connect with nature, with the trees that give us the air when we can understand that like the rivers and creeks and streams are the rivers and creeks and streams of blood in our veins 
we are the waters, we are the wind and the breath, we have electricity pumping through our hearts in every moment. The bones inside of us are like the stones in the mountains. It's like, why would I want to do anything harmful to anything outside of me because it's all just a reflection of me. So if I harm someone else, I'm harming myself. The same as like when I harm myself, I'm harming the earth, I'm harming the world. And so it's been it's been similar, like a, a, a guiding light and a compass of mine to be philanthropic and to be of service in the world my whole life. And I have also learned what it feels like to you know, witness, be on the other side again, like of coaches who basically just like stole my money and ran and, um, and it sucks. Again, it's hard lesson, not fun, not pleasant. And I think that also I just, I want to be of service and I want to help people. If you, if you believe that someone is casting black magic on you, I want to help you figure out how to unwind that. Like I know this couple right now, they're like afraid of the ex-girlfriend and, they're just starting off. They're like falling in love and they're afraid that she casts black magic on them. And I'm like, you guys, the fact that you're starting your relationship off in fear, like that's on you. That there's something inside of both of you that you need to look at. And knowing the, the guy, I'm like, this is your shame that you're feeling from running away and running into this new relationship. Like you're feeling shame. You're feeling afraid. You're generating fear. It's then like bleeding out into what could be a new love and you have to choose something different than that. And so I really just believe that we are all creating our reality and and I, I want to create goodness in mine and I want goodness to come back to me. And so if I give out goodness, hopefully that will be reciprocated. And, and that's really, if it's all one, you know, then like you can't escape. You can't really do anything bad because it's just going to come back to you anyway. So that's that's how I see it. That's awesome. That's great stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I wonder, do you ever worry that you may come across as contradictory to people when you say something like Bla black magic and spells, that's all bullshit. But then I'll be like, well, Mia, isn't that sort of what you do? You kind of help people with in, in these mystical ways. Like, how do you thread that needle? That Not to say that you're you're doing anything that's you know untoward or anything like that, but like the fact that you're telling people, hey, listen, if you think someone's put a spell on you, that's bullshit. But let me sh let me show you the right way. How how do you thread that? So to me, it's not about showing you the right way. It's about like helping you work with your own belief system. So if you believe that the black magic has come at you, it's like, okay, well, if you can believe it can come in, then how are you actualizing it on its way out? What are you doing? And I'm never going to tell someone, I don't say that when literally someone reached out to me two days ago and said, hey, this guy I'm in love with has a curse put on him. Can you help me? And I was like, yes, I can help you, but please know that I'm going to do it very differently. And my approach to that is looking with this guy and saying, bro, where are you cursing yourself? Every single day, what are you doing that's cursing you? You, you know, I don't, I don't know. I haven't talked to this person yet, but it's like, you know, if you're taking substances, or if you are, you know, uh, speaking really unkindly to yourself when you're not productive enough, or if you're, you know, anything, whatever it is, if you're, if you're looking at in the mirror, you know, you don't seem to have this problem and you're like calling yourself fat and ugly. That's the curse. That's the thing. And so for me, again, it's, it's about knowing ourselves and our belief systems. So if we believe that black magic can be put on us, it's because in some way we are putting black magic out. That's the, only, it, it, that's the only way it would be possible, right? If you look at the universal laws and the holographic universe and understand quantum physics and the double slit experiment and how electrons are being observed and the fact that like the everything only crystallizes when it's being observed and we're observing it. And my first book, Intuition, is all about the law of correspondence as above, so below, as within, so without. Anything that is outside of us exists inside of us and anything that exists inside of us exists outside of us. And so that's really what I help people work on. If you have a complaint about something outside of you, how can you look at its reflection inside of you, unwind that energy, and then be able to see 
things shift and change in your external world. And so that's the kind of, again, it's like the lighthouse thing. You don't have to come to shore. You can stay in the ocean. You can do whatever you want. Like keep on keeping on that trajectory if that's what you want. But I'm going to stand here, again, shining a light on what I believe are the, the patterns. Again, within all of us, everybody's trauma, everybody's wounding, everybody's belief system is different. And so I, my intention is just to shine a light and I'm doing it with myself every day. It's <laughs> like, my God, <laughs> so much illumination of shadows and, and, and patterns and programming and belief systems from my dad and how I relate with men and women and people and myself. Like I'm always doing that. And so I just want to support people in, again, like learning how to fish for themselves because you won't need, if you actually figure it out. And again, it's not like the right way. Anytime anyone says this way is the only way or this way is the right way, then I'm always like, well, then it ain't the way for me. Because especially when you look at spirituality, God, consciousness, growth, personal development, if, if it's like a mountain, eagles are going to fly to the top. Snakes are going to slither. Mountain goats can scale up sides of cliff faces and nobody else is going on. You know, cats can like jump the 12 feet to get up to another place. And humans are going to take a trail. And some of them are going to want a machete and bushwhack. And some of them are like, no, I want the nice, gentle, easy switchbacks. You know, we're all going to get to the top of the mountain our own way. And so I don't believe that there is one right way. But I have found that this is a way that is deeply transformative, incredibly healing, leads to so much more capacity for your dreams and your visions to come to fruition because the goal is to excavate what's in the way. Excavate the anger or the shame or the pain or again, the misbelief that like you deserve black magic to be put on you because you've done something wrong or you're bad, um, which is definitely the case of like this, the guy for sure. It's like he knows that he's done wrong and he's done something bad and he's trying to run away from it and so he's afraid of facing it and now he's like bringing it into his other relationships like okay well that's on you like that's not your ex-girlfriend's problem that's on you and so I think that we can all find a way to look at ourselves more clearly and and get out of the way the things that are blocking what we want, which is more love and more harmony and more peace and more freedom and more abundance and more ease and more play and enjoyment and connection. And so it's a way that I have found works really well. That's why I wrote the book about the law of correspondence. There's never been a book written just about how the language of the universe is communicating with you and how you can do inner work to change your external reality. And um, and it just, it works. I've been doing it with myself and thousands of people for the last decade and it works. So it's a way up the mountain that I find to be, again, challenging and strenuous, but so worth it. And like the view from the top, unparalleled. That's so cool. Uh, Stoic principles, do they seem like they're they part of your, part of sort of like your uh, your bag? Because I feel like a lot of stuff you're, you're sharing with me today is like, it's all about the internal, like not letting the external affect what's happening to you. Is, is Am I, am I, sort of psychoanalyzing you correctly that there's a little bit of sto a, a dash of a stoicism in you of stoicism man i don't know i'm a pretty emotional gal so i definitely i'm like oh joe why thank you so much no one's ever referred to me as a stoic before um i don't know that i would say that i definitely think that the inquiry yeah i think that it is all it all it's all coming from within um but i think that there's for me at least, like emotions and feeling all of your feelings, especially going back to talking about the witch wound, like our emotions are one of the the um, most damaged aspects of all the result of, of yeah, worldwide colonization. And, and Christianity is like, oh, men aren't allowed to cry. You're not allowed to feel vulnerable. You're not allowed to be weak in any single moment. If you don't keep your facade up, like you're in trouble and you're a bad boy. And and women aren't allowed to get angry or stand up for themselves or, you know, be fierce in in the protection of their own boundaries or their children or whatever it is. And so I I don't know that I would consider myself a stoic by well, any means. You know, what, you know where, I, where I was getting that from, Mia? Because I feel like stoicism, my, my, my big takeaway from stoicism yeah. from reading about it over the last several years is that you can control what you can control. 
like the out, like you, and and I feel like with you sharing those stories about the guy who feels cursed, it's like you said, it's more of like, it's not being cursed from another person. It's him what? doing it to himself. So that's where I was getting that sto stoic vibe from you. What? Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know. I just, that's, that's the feel I was getting. Like, like, because a lot of the stuff you've been talking about is the fact that we kind of like control our, our moods, our, our careers. It, it, it's not someone else doing yeah. it. it it's, 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 it's me, myself and I, to a certain extent. Yeah. Totally. Every choice that you make, again, like hard choices, easy life. If you make the hard choice, you're going to watch something beautiful unfold in your life. If you make the easy choice, maybe you won't. And so, yeah, I really, I do believe, I loved how you said that, like we can control what we can control. There are greater forces. There is a beautiful, vast, massive, mysterious universe, and we can control what we can control. And that is our belief systems and how we respond to them and how we allow them to inform our behaviors and how we react to things and how when when challenges come, when the outside world is chaotic, which like, trust me, I just ended a five-year relationship, lost both my cats, moved cities, left my house. Like, I get it. I've had a pretty chaotic year. And guess what? Like, I can feel all of that. I can feel the agony of heartbreak and I can, and I can run and dance and scream my rage. And like, I can see the changing seasons and I can hear the songs of the birds and the crazy voices inside my head. Like, I have this capacity for aliveness. And, and I think that that's really what we're missing is that, you know, we should feel our feelings and pain is okay to, 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 and it's, we can learn from it and grow through it. And the only things we can control are ourselves and everything else is going to be a mystery. And so it's okay to choose to like, I've been in the dark bullshit this whole summer. Like, oh, it's been like beautiful summer. And I'm like, oh, in the underworld and sad and like recovering. That's okay. It's allowing me to be reborn in spring, like my own internal springtime and, and to feel the blossoming. And God, doesn't it make me appreciate the good times? Doesn't it make me appreciate what it means to fall in love and to be seen by someone? Of course. And so, yeah, I think that all we can do is control ourselves. And when life throws us curveballs and hands us lemons, it's like, yeah, do you want to knock it out of the park and make some lemonade or not? Love it. Love it. All right. Uh, you mentioned rage. You talked about some of your programs. So let's dig into because I read the article that was in Fortune inside the $4,500 rage ritual retreats going viral on TikTok. Before we get into that, tell me about going viral on TikTok. Was this a surprise to you? Was this intentional? Uh, let's start with that. Utterly, utterly a surprise. I made a beautiful, long YouTube video. I made like a YouTube video. One, I don't even go on TikTok. I don't have TikTok on my phone. My team runs my TikTok. So I'm not, I don't use TikTok. So I'm, I'm a TikTok noob 100% in every way. I don't know anything about TikTok. So I made a beautiful YouTube video and I guess, I think my team did make like a snippet that went for TikTok, but I could never have imagined what happened. Even just the title of that article. The craziest part is that it's like, $4,500 rage ritual retreat. First of all, who could rage that much and that long? It's a, <laughs> it's a week long retreat. The rage ritual is one ritual. It's one hour in the week long transformative experience. Uh, the, the retreat itself, again, is like held in a castle or like a beautiful wedding venue. It has Michelin star food, three meals a day, amazing chefs, gorgeous landscapes, and like, cold plunges and saunas and just like it's a beautiful experience so that's the funniest part you know some Portland page picked it picked it up and they were like this camp in Oregon where women go to vent their anger at their husbands I'm like we're literally in Scotland at a castle <laughs> this is not a camp in Oregon you know and it's not a rage ritual retreat it's a transformative immersive feminine embodiment retreat where we do a rage ritual um so that was that the whole thing, like how misconstrued it was, how mislabeled it was, how many people said that it was just girls screaming about their husbands in the woods, and how many people really, you know, the comments that I was expecting that I knew, whenever we've shared anything about rage before, 95% of the comments are, oh my God, as soon as I started seeing this or as soon as I heard this, I, 
I immediately started crying or like, I know that I need this. Like, oh my God, this just feels so important. Like, I want to do something like this. Those are the majority of the comments in obviously like my audience. And then when the wider internet got a hold of it and, you know, there are pages where like random people just ripped my video and, and they've got like 50 million views, 100 million views on the video and the comment section changes there, you know, again, because it's been mislabeled and misrepresented. And so, no, that was, it was entirely a surprise for me. I could never have imagined that. I thought it was making like a tasteful, artistic piece about feminine rage and healing. And, uh, and again, it's also not about just rage. It's about grief. It's about sadness. It's about pain. It's about any abuse that, you know, rape and betrayal and, you know, physical violence and harm and, and the harm that's been done to the earth and the sadness that we don't have leadership that we feel like really supports us or, or represents us. It's about all of those things, not just venting anger at your husband. Like who has that? Why would you be married to someone you have that much anger toward? <laughs> like find a different relationship, you know? Um, so it's, it's really, yeah, it was very misunderstood, but it's a, it's a deeply sacred, beautiful, important practice that again, like what everything else we've been talking about is an opportunity for you to choose, okay, I'm going to touch this emotion all the way. I'm going to go into it. I'm going to let it say all the things that it hasn't said. And on the other side, that energy will be liberated. It will be freed. And when you look at trauma work like Basil van der Kork or, you know, Gabor Mate's work, there is scientific evidence that suppressing all of these emotions for our entire lives is what causes disease and sickness, like cancer and irritable bowel and like Crohn's disease, autoimmune conditions. But giving yourself a safe, contained opportunity to go all the way into those emotions and feel them 100%, which is exactly what the intention of the rage ritual is, has a lasting impact on your capacity to regulate yourself and your emotions. And you are a different person on the other side of it, and your body physiologically transforms. And so that's really what I am here for with that ritual. And I, I just stand behind it and beside it all day, every day. And it, it was really... It was surprising and it was also just disappointing that the world would still in 2024, like we can't just support women standing up. They're not hurting anybody. They're they're in the woods in a private estate. Again, this is not like, oh, we're going to come upon them in the woods. No, it's a 2,000 acre private estate. <laughs> and um, and they're doing it together, you know, Stam standing side by side in sisterhood like, hey, you know, I've been violently abused or I've been molested or I've been you know, hurt and betrayed, or I've been cheated on, or I've been, you know, it's, it's way more anger at their dads than at their husbands. That's for sure. You know, um, the, the ways that I was hurt or that my boundaries were crossed and wow, I've never said these words before. And the person that I'm angry at isn't standing here. It's just me and my kids aren't here and my spouse isn't here. No one's here to be hurt. No one's here to be harmed. This is just me and my emotions feeling free for the first time. Usually for many women that do the rage ritual, it's the first time they've ever let themselves touch that part of, of their pain or their sadness or their feelings. And it's so beautiful. And it's really, it's really a sacred, precious, important practice that I, I feel so honored to hold. That's awesome. And so if I may ask, how did that become part of what you do? Like why was why, why do you think the rage was, was uh, like you said, a very small part of a, a, a long encompassing program? Uh, why do you think that was so important to include and, and why did you include it? Well, it wasn't part of the original itinerary. Um, <laughs> the first time we did it, what happened was it was a very like Hogwarts, you know, we, I had a falconer come. And so it was like we can hold owls and eagles and like this whole thing was so cool. So I'd been told that the the falconry place was like a rescue center. And so he's rescuing these birds and they, you know, they can't fly anymore. The guy gets there. He basically tells us like, no, I'm pretty much a zoo. Like that's a lie. So I'd paid like thousands of pounds to have this guy, this is in the UK, have this guy come. And it's actually a zoo. It, that isn't, again, going back to the regenerative capitalism. That's not what I believe in. I would never have supported some guy that I knew was bringing like locked, caged right. birds, you know? And he had this beautiful golden eagle and she was not allowed to fly. The other birds could fly around and then he'd call them back. She wasn't allowed to fly. She was strapped to his arm 
and she would try to take off and fly away and he would swing her by her feet and back up onto her his arm an eagle like in every i have chills just thinking about it in every indigenous civilization the most respected bird like represents communion with god and spirit and this guy's got one tied to his arm and keeps swinging her upside down so that night after that happened i I had, you know, it could only be called like a vision or like a visitation as, you know, the, the Christians, I guess, would call it. It was like Jesus came to me. Um, it was like the goddess came to me and the eagle's name had been Artemis. Her name is Artemis, which is a archetype of the Greek great mother goddess, the name that the Greeks called the great mother goddess, who is one of the first goddesses that I ever worked with, whose names I learned. And so sh I have a deep relationship with her. And it was like there was this fiery goddess queen pacing back and forth in my room, just yelling at me. I can't believe you let that happen. You're the leader here. Like, you're the teacher. You, what did, you didn't do anything. Like, and I'm still in the process of trying to save this eagle. I hope that guy never listens to this podcast because I am going to save that eagle if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> and um, but so I woke up not having slept, feeling like the wrath of God through through me in every way. She was upset with me. She was upset that it had been happening. And it was such a representation of the feminine. We were tied by our feet. We're so powerful. We can fly, but we're tied by our feet. And someone just keeps swinging us back around. So I woke up ragey the next day. I was like, damn it. I fucked up as a teacher. I didn't lead the way I would want to. This guy has a zoo. Like I supported something that I don't want to support. And I woke up that morning. We were supposed to go for this like beautiful coastal walk along the Scottish lowlands. And I was like, we're doing a rage ritual. <laughs> and so, um, and so we added it to the itinerary and it was so powerful. It was the biggest group I'd ever led it with. I'd only led it with probably like 20 people before we had 30 people in that group. And it was serious and it was screaming sobs and, you know, open bloody blisters from all the sticks and the, and it was crazy. It was really, really intense. The girls went for it. It was wild. And then it started being, you know, I've, I've always had at least one or two repeats. So there's always someone who comes back to a retreat because they're just so powerful and amazing. And so it became one of those things where it was like, oh, I had to come back for another rage ritual. Like I had to come wow. back and get more rage out. I had to come back and do more. And it, it has become something that then once we started telling people that it was part of the practice and part of the process, they, they were like, I'm coming because of the rage ritual. I need that. I need to get my anger out. I have been abused and I've been a people pleaser since. You know, a lot of people respond to violence or abuse or affront or boundaries crossing by by shutting down, you know, especially women, right? Like men will kind of respond by getting bigger or maybe like some Napoleon complex or whatever it is. But But women generally respond by getting smaller and getting quieter. And so the quieter and the smaller we become in the face of someone telling us that like that's all we'll ever be just to have a moment of eruption, just to have a moment of letting it out and letting it free is why I, I kept doing it. I was like, OK, great. You know, I am a, obviously I'm a very well expressed, assertive, direct woman. I have a lot of those like masculine qualities. I know how to say what I want. But even in that moment with the falconer, I didn't. Like I didn't stand up for myself. I did just let myself get shut down. I didn't tell him, hey, this is not okay. Like, I don't believe in this. Actually, like we're done here, you know? I didn't do that. And and so even a really powerful, well-spoken, outspoken, audacious, bold woman like me can still have that same issue arise. And so that's why we we keep doing it is because it's so important. And again, it allows women, you know, you're married. It allows women to instead of, venting your anger at your husband like heal your anger work with your emotions let them out and go back again you know this has been such an interwoven conversation go back being able to make different choices choose how to be more conscientious in your communication with your loved ones whether it's your children or your coworkers or your spouse or your parents or whatever it is choose oh i've i've let that go or I've set down that sword, you know, I can come with more compassion and more love and light in my heart to be able to communicate my needs to you. And actually, for the first time, I feel like my needs are valid and important. And I'm instead of 
sacrificing or abandoning myself, I'm going to tell you what they are. And if you're able to meet them, great. And if you're not, like, that's okay. And again, that's my responsibility to figure out how to make sure that they do get met. That's so cool. Um, all right. I got to ask this question because yeah. I, wonder, I always wonder with like, you know, the Rolling Stones, they had to play Start Me Up for 40 years. Like the, if, if you go to a Rolling Stones concert, you're expected that the Rolling Stones are going to do Start Me Up or even go further uh, satisfaction that they've been singing for 60 years. How worried are you that this rage ritual will be, will be such a fabric of your being that you won't be able to do another one of these retreats or, or, or programs without it being part of it? Are you comfortable with that? Are you worried about that? I just out of curiosity, because I always feel about, I always have like this rock star thing of like, oh God, you know, when you go to a concert and they don't play the hits, you walk to the bathroom. So how, how do you, how, how do you, how do you manage that? You know, it's so funny because I use the same example, but with Alanis Morissette, I went to her oh. 25 year reunion concert and she like, you know, is singing Jagged Little Pill and all these crazy songs that it's like, poor woman. She like had her spiritual awakening a year later and she's still singing her ragey albums. You know, it's all yeah. anyone wants to hear. So it's a really great question. No one has asked me that. And I love a new question, Joe. Good. I don't feel worried about it. It doesn't feel resonant for me personally anymore, especially like getting out of my relationship and feeling I was really frustrated with my my former partner for not caring as much about the doing the inquiry and like looking within. It's like, okay, you got a lot of complaints about outside, about like people outside or things happening outside. So like instead of pointing like this, like look at those three fingers pointing back this way, like let's do this for a minute. And that was just something that we didn't agree much on. And I, I did get frustrated and I got angry about that. And, and it didn't help us. It, it hurt both of us because I, I stayed. I abandoned myself. I, I rejected my needs and I, I stayed with someone who didn't share the same value that I did. And it made him feel like he wasn't enough. And so I've really had a deep, especially I've led several rage rituals like for that Fortune article. We, we had a rage ritual in LA. We just did one um, last week as well. And I feel a level of completion. It's not like fully, fully complete, but it's like a trickle at this point. It's a trickle left for me. I don't have, I'm leading the practice and I don't have anything in the tank to like, rah, you know, I don't have that left. And so it feels, I, I feel really neutral about it personally and internally and so it's such an honor to lead it I mean we'll see if 40 years from now I'm still leading it you know I I but maybe you know because there's still gonna be women who are be until men and women both like there's plenty of women who come in with rage against their mothers who you know made them force them to diet or told them they were too fat or you know told them you'll never be loved by a man unless you're a b or c like there's plenty of women who are raging at their mothers also but until the cycles and lineages of abuse stop, we're going to have shit to be angry about. And until families and parents actually raise their children with as much consciousness and as much healing as possible, we're going to keep like passing down these patterns of wounding and scarcity and, you know, disempowerment. And so I'm going to keep leading the practice for the people who need it and who want it from me as long as it feels inspired as long as it feels right i got i got all kinds of rituals up my sleeve you know for for the new moon in leo and and the lion's gate portal when we were in france in this giant beautiful palace last month my team was like okay so what are we doing for the lion's gate ritual and i was like i have no idea we will just go there and we're gonna see what happens i was like the only thing i have planned is lion's breath it's like one type of breath where you stick your tongue out and this whole beautiful wild somatic amazing ritual unfolded and people were so into it so like i again i want to teach people how to fish i want to teach people how to heal i want to teach people how to be brave enough to make the hard choices that allow them to live the kind of lives that they want. And I'm going to keep serving that and like stepping outside of myself to be in service to other people's healing and, and to the growth of our species as a whole 
till the day I die, bro. I'm never going to stop. I'm never giving up. I want to live in a magical world. I want to live in a healed world. Whether it's delusional of me or not, I think we could create a utopia. And I am going to keep striving for that with every single breath and step I take. So if that means leading a rage ritual 40 years from now and I get to stand in a cacophony and a symphony of women feeling brave and safe enough to heal themselves, I'm going to be like, fuck yeah, I'm living my dharma, you know, I'm doing what I came here to do. And, and that's, you know, it's like what you said, you got that moral compass. That's what, what I was asked of, you know, is like be of service, be here for others and be happy and find what you love. And I love watching people heal. And I love the result of hard, painful shit getting alchemized into, you know, like that's what alchemy was, led into gold. So let my pain, let my sadness, let my grief be alchemized into some gem of wisdom, some gold that will serve me in my life. And that's what I came here for. So I'm going to keep doing that as long as God lets me. Awesome. 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 Awesome stuff. Uh, me and folks want to find out more about you. I obviously we mentioned you're on the TikTok, but uh, <laughs> where should they start if they want to find out more about Mia? Yeah, everywhere is Mia Magic, M-I-A-M-A-G-I-K. So my Instagram, YouTube, website, TikTok, all the platforms, M-I-A-M-A-G-I-K, magic with a K. Awesome. Mia, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. Great questions. Great conversation. Loved it. And that's today's Good Listen. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Joe Partavilla or on TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note and tell me your story, just write me a note, Joe Partavilla at ProtonMail.com. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, tap that big old thumbs up button. But until next time, I'll see you then. Adios.